Hi folks, um, so the next video we're going to do is about uh, Prohibition which is for uh, Paper 2 Section A which is the Roaring Twenties section. So um, Prohibition, it was the banning of alcohol in America and we'll go into that in more detail in a moment but basically what happens is in January of 1919 um, the American Constitution which is the laws upon which America is founded, the laws upon which America operates is amended. In other words, it's it's changed and it's going to ban alcoholic drinks. Okay, Now, this is called the Volstead Act and it comes in in January 1920 and it basically says um, liquor, which it defines liquor as any drink which contains more than 0.5% of alcohol. So your average bottled beer would be four and a half percent alcohol. So it's banning anything, defining anything as liquor as 0.5 percent of alcohol or more. And the movement actually began at the back end of the 1800s. And this was really because a lot of men who were seen as with the breadwinners in this time period, the people who were making the money, were spending their money and their family's money in pubs or saloons and <coughs> this was obviously the, the family money and it was taken away from family time so you've got two groups were formed um, towards the back end of the 1800s and that, those are the Women's Christians Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League right and by the time World War I starts in Europe in 1914 12 of America's states have become dry in other words there's no drinking there right so alcohol's banned so the arguments that were put forward is why would people support a ban on alcohol well it could cause absenteeism from work so you lose your job you don't earn your money you can't support your family and this would be largely due to hangovers um, another one is because of the war and um, the leading beer supplier at this time <coughs> was the company called Pabst and Bush which were a German company and uh, many patriotic Americans decided they weren't going to buy from them they weren't going to fund a German company as previously mentioned it destroyed families fathers who were the you know like the, the worker at the time were spending their times in, um, after work rather than going home they were spending it in the saloon and they were spending the family money there as well and you know alcohol can cause violence public disorder public drunkenness so it was seen as it being a, um, a bad cause of um, a more violent society so by the end of world war one in 1918 75 percent of america has become dry right and it hasn't really taken that great of an effort to get to this so why we keep asking why how could this happen and really this the simple answer is is if you think about it the groups that supported prohibition were just better organized they were there for a longer period of time they've been operating since the back end of the 1800s so the main group who came in to um, protest against prohibition was about 1918 and this is a bit too late and this, these were known as the association against the prohibition amendment and they brought in arguments saying well alcohol was necessary because it was medicinal so it's similar to like you know the legalized cannabis arguments that people put out a deal you know people need it it's a medicine it's a stress reliever etc and you found that a lot of the um, support for keeping alcohol and um, supporting the association against the prohibition amendment was more in the northern states and the southern states and this is because the northern states were um, more urban so if you think about it, you've got big cities in the north places like New York Boston where you've got your, your bars and you've got your urban lifestyle whereas the southern states were a lot more conservative in their outlook and the church played a much larger role you may have heard of the term the Bible Belt in the south so they saw alcohol as you know like causing a lot of the problems in society so there was a lot of um, support for banning alcohol in the church and the church was more active overall in people's lifestyles in the southern states than in the north so the prohibition came into effect in January 1920 and in the weeks leading up to it people were buying alcohol um, from stores 
as you would expect but the night before was not the drunken free-for-all that people would have expected it was pretty quiet and the church when it, when the law came through held thanksgiving to thank you know the lord for passing into this ban of the demon drink uh, congregations in churches said um, you know like the demon drink is gone thank you know thank goodness and the, an example that was there for it was an ex-democrat presidential candidate called William Jennings who's, who pointed out to the stat that two and a half billion dollars at this time were being spent um, on whiskey and liquor in the United States which is three times more than what was being invested in education so it's, it's a pretty damning stat that okay now um, there's obviously a flip side of the coin and the flip side of the coin is that it will be very hard to enforce this law so prohibition agents were appointed but there were too few and it was very very easy to bribe um, prohibition agents you know you've got to think about guys like Al Capone were the equivalent of Bill Gates and wealth in those times they could buy off the law if needs be and um, you also got speakeasies popping up um, particularly in cities and this is from the old Irish term think about immigration for um, an illegal bar and these were like former saloons and basements and sometimes they were dressed up even as jazz clubs and the like and you would see um, signs on the street maybe he's pointing towards a speakeasy people would pass it on by word of mouth and um, you would see you know like some you know even like rich rich coffee shops restaurants and stuff you, you, you would have an alternate menu which you could ask for you could see whiskey going in so an Irish coffee being made perhaps you could order from the alternate drinks menu I've seen the whole um, spinning wall cabinet where on one side it's all above board and then you flip it around and there's all kind of liquor and, and um, alcohol and there's even tell of um, <clears throat> beer barrels um, basically having everything but the alcohol in and giant syringes coming along and pumping the alcohol into the beer barrels to make it alcoholic so by the end of the 1920s um, You've got about 30,000 speakeasies in New York and 200,000 across the United States. And you're also seeing about 5,000 people per year dying from making their own alcohol, so making moonshine and the like at home, which God knows the strength, has it been regulated properly, etc. It was dangerous. There was 5,000 people died <coughs> from making their own alcohol. Moonshine could also cause people to go blind and the like. America is also a huge country so if you think about the size of america right across the top of the united states is canada it's the same length you cannot police that entire border so bootleggers were coming in from canada bringing the alcohol into the united states so places in particular like um chicago you know it was just across the border it was easy you know you, if you're a farmer now on the canadian american border you don't go through passport control every day it's too hard to police and mexico's to the south so you can smuggle in that way as well it was just impossible to place this um you did have uh, prohibition agents who stuck to their job so you had um two guys known as um einstein and moore who basically dressed up in disguises um so they went from everything building site laborers to american football players to students to bus conductors shipyard workers truck drivers musicians and <coughs> they were responsible for three thousand speakeasies being raided they arrested approximately 4,900 people and about 3 million bottles of spirits in the first five and a half years of prohibition were confiscated. On top of this, you've got Elliot Ness, who was famous for working against Al Capone in Chicago with his untouchables, meaning they couldn't be bought, they couldn't be paid off, whereas Capone would run Chicago on the back largely of alcohol. The most damning indictment maybe of alcohol is what it led to. It's said to have opened Pandora's box that would never be closed because it led to the birth of the gangster. It was basically a system that was being run by the Tommy Gun. And alcohol was huge business. But from there, gangsters like Capone wouldn't just be selling booze but, and setting up speakeasies, but they would be involved in maybe racketeering where you're paying, um, making businesses in local areas pay for your protection against these rival gangs. Um, brothels were being set up, prostitution, violence was on the increase <coughs> because of the gangsters. Capone ran Chicago, 
He was known to have bribed numerous officials, politicians, police. He was seen he called himself the mayor of Chicago. Um, he didn't really need to fear arrest. He was on the front page, front cover of Time magazine at one point. It was well known what he was up to, and at his peak, he had <coughs> one thousand men um, under his employment. Right, he was making sixty to a hundred million dollars a year. Now, Babe Ruth who was the top sports star of the time, was making $80,000 a year in the same time period, which was the equivalent of about £7 million. So think about Capone's in that Bill Gates style of wealth. He's in that bracket. We think he was responsible for 227 plus murders in four years. He was arrested for none of them. He went to jail eventually on income tax evasion. He was clearly to be responsible for the Semban and the Nap massacre, where six of his men were gunned down, um, rivals of the uh, rivals of the Bugs Moran gang, whilst dressed as police, so they dropped their weaponry and then went shot against a wall. Um, but on the flip side, with Capone, um, you could say that during the Depression, he was responsible for setting up soup kitchens. He said he didn't want his town, Chicago, to suffer. He also was um, selling um, barrels of alcohol to people for twelve dollars when their market value was eighteen so people could sell them on because the demand was still high and make a six dollar profit a third profit for themselves so he was obviously making his sales but other people would benefit from that and when he was in jail he eventually went to Alcatraz he actually did ask to be um, let out um, to look for the, ki the kidnapped child of Lucky Lindy the, um, the aircraft pilot and not everyone would hate Al Capone some people would view Al Capone as a man who, you know, he's making wealth by breaking the law in a time period when the Depression saw people struggling. Why should he benefit? But there were other people saying, well, he is supplying a demand. Prohibition was very, very unpopular. Um, as the, you know, the law came in, people sort of didn't realise if he's what they'd asked for. So Capone was seen as sticking it to the police, sticking it to this very um, unpopular um, amendment to the American Constitution and gain support that way. Um, so he was a polarizing figure in society. He said, I'm simply supplying a demand. You know, if I do it, I'm a gangster, but if you get it on um, I think it was Lakeshore Boulevard in Chicago, it's classed as silver service. What's the difference? All right, so he is a polarizing character, is Al Capone. Interestingly enough, um, his, one of his brothers, changed his name to Two Gun Heart and was a Prohibition agent um, in the Midwest, in Nebraska, I believe. Okay, So in the end, Prohibition was seen to be not working. The alcohol industry did provide jobs. And in 1932, Roosevelt attempted to uh, close Pandora's box and he brought the 21st Amendment in in 1933 when president to get rid of Prohibition. Thanks for watching.